Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us tonight for the first CPD event in the St George Hospital Grand Round Series for GPs. Uh, these webinars will occur on the third Tuesday of the month. Tonight's topic is antibiotic allergies, a practical approach to assessment. My name is Bertha Harvey and I'm the CPD and Events Manager at Central East and Sydney PHN. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and sovereign people of the land across which we work. We recognise their, their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I would now like to introduce uh, Jan Sadler, the Practice Support Manager at Central Eastern Sydney PHN. Hi everyone. Um, you may remember from last year that we conducted some consultations with general practitioners on our general practice workforce program. Some via a survey and some were one-on-one -on -one chat. Um, just to review what that program is, the Commonwealth Department have engaged PHNs to help provide independent evidence-based recommendations to inform the geographic distribution and placement of GP registrars, so as to meet the community's current and future GP workforce needs. We, as the PHN, don't have an actual say in the placement of GP registrars, but the more information and feedback that you can give us and it will help us inform the Commonwealth and the two colleges of any workforce needs in our region. This year, we're continuing to work with the other New South Wales PHNs and the Commonwealth Department of Aged Care in supporting this program. We will be consulting with GPs, GP supervisors and GP registrars and gathering local information on general practice workforce issues and concerns. Your input will help us understand the enablers and what helps and supports the workforce and also any barriers that might come up. We want to talk about the training capacity of GP registrars within our regions. We're also interested in any changes in your local areas and the environment, such as new building complexes and any infrastructure concerns. We would also be interested in any possible solutions to current and emerging workforce issues and shortages that you might be experiencing. We will be offering you all the opportunity to give feedback through various forms, including um, an easy online form, but also if you wanted to discuss one-on-one -on -one with us what is happening in your region, please reach out to us. I think we can all agree that general practice workforce is a hot topic at the moment, and so it's really important that, that we're able to gather that feedback from our local areas and our local GPs and staff. It's really important. And, you know, we have a lot of practices in our region, 572, and we have a lot of GP catchments, as they call it, um, so it's really important that we get that feedback so we can feed back to the Commonwealth and to the colleges what's going on out there. Um, you can come take myself at the PHN if you would like to participate in further conversation. My email and phone number will be available in the follow-up email from tonight and you'll also receive down the track um, some um, surveys to complete and they won't be too onerous, I promise. Um, thank you for your time. Thanks, Jan. Um, I would now like to introduce uh, Kylie Turner, who is the chronic kidney disease um, CNC from St George Hospital, and also welcome Dr Martina Gleeson, who will be our GP facilitator this evening. Thanks, Kylie. So as Bertha just said, I'm the chronic kidney disease CNC at St George, but I'm also the chair of a integrated care chronic diseases network, which was a network set up um, back in 2017, and um, they came together to um, aid in helping the GPs within our local health districts to navigate the tertiary hospital. Um, one of our initiatives of this group became the Grand Rounds, which has now been going for, this is our third year. Um, and we're also looking to roll out a practice nurse Grand Rounds with our first session being held on the 11th of April. And that'll be around um, helping practice nurses to navigate services within the hospital with chronic disease CNCs. Now I'll hand over to Martina. Hi everyone, I'm Martina Gleeson. I'm the Health Pathways Senior Clinical Editor for Southeastern Sydney. Um, and I'll just be facilitating the chat today. Um, a few updates, we've got some new health pathways in the last couple of months, um, including one on transgender um, healthcare for people who are curious and would like some guidelines. Um, and we do also have a health pathway that has all the detail of uh, Dr Sullivan's clinic. So um, that will be sent out to you in the resources email after the presentation. So I'm going to hand over to Richard. Um, thanks so much, Martina. And Thanks uh, for inviting me and um, thanks everyone for coming. 
Um, so my name's Richie Sullivan. I'm one of the infectious diseases staff specialists at um, St George Hospital. Um, and today we'll be talking about antibiotic allergy, a practical approach to assessment. So this is the um, education names of the um, St George Hospital Integrated Care Chronic Diseases Working Party. So the session tonight, um, our learning outcomes, we're basically going to go through the classifications of antibiotic adverse drug reactions and allergies. We'll describe how to assess and document antibiotic allergies to optimise antibiotic use. We'll determine risk classification of antibiotic allergy labels, cross-reactivity patterns, and how this helps with antibiotic choice, and describe how antibiotic allergies are further assessed and managed in hospital inpatients in a specialist clinic. Um, we'll I've tried to make it uh, interactive, so there's going to be a few polls that come up. So the first, um, we'll start with a clinical case. So um, we have a 72 year old lady that presents with dyspnea and is diagnosed with mild community acquired pneumonia. Uh, she reports she has an allergy to amoxicillin, uh, stating last time she had amoxicillin five years ago, she had nausea. It's clear on the history that she reports no rash and no swelling. And you can actually see amoxicillin is listed on your records as an allergy, but in the uh, in the um, section of about details of the reaction, nothing is actually written, and so it's just unknown. Um, so, what's the best approach? Um, so we've got a list of four options there. So if you could read through those and um, um, enter your poll, and then uh, we'll move on to um, talk about this issue. Fantastic. Great. So, um, yeah, most of you um, suggested prescribing amoxicillin and delabel amoxicillin as a listing as an allergy in the um, allergy medical record. So this just brings up the issue of um, about the differences between an adverse drug reaction and an allergy. So the definition of uh, adverse drug reaction hasn't sort of been updated since um, WHO left a uh, created a definition in 1972 and essentially it's a response to a drug that's noxious and unintended and occurs at doses normally used for man for the prophylaxis diagnosis or therapy of disease or modification of physiological function. Allergy is a subset of adverse um, drug reaction uh, which is actually immunologically mediated. So in this case um, essentially this patient is uh, reporting a side effect and um, I think you all picked up that uh, this doesn't have an immunological basis. And so we advocate not to actually um, place this as an allergy in the electronic medical record, um, because as I go into later, it's been shown that it um, uh, leads to sort of uh, use of uh, second line antibiotics and worse um, outcomes. Um, so in terms of the allergy record, we just want to try and list things that are potentially immunologically um, based rather than um, uh, side effects. So those side effects could include nausea, uh, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, uh, abdominal pain. In terms of um, classifying adverse drug reaction, uh, there's been sort of um, more movement uh, away from the gel and combs uh, sort of classification and then to talk about more about on-target uh, adverse drug reactions and off-target drug uh, adverse drug reactions. So on-target on are those that are predictable based on the, the drug action. So for instance, with antibiotics, um, uh, due to the alteration in the microbiome, it can sort of lead to effects um, based on its action uh, that lead to things like uh, C. diff uh, associated pseudomembranous colitis. On the other hand, the off-target um, can be subdivided into non-immunologically mediated hypersensitivity reactions and immunologically mediated hypersensitivity reactions. The non-immunologically mediated hypersensitivity reactions can involve basically di uh, direct cellular toxicity. And so this is the issue that uh, amounts uh, from aminoglycoside acute tubular necrosis. But there's also um, um, some receptors uh, that have been found and we can actually get direct mast cell activation. And so this is um, immune receptor interaction and uh, this is the basis of the vancomycin infusion react, uh, reaction or fl fluoroquinolones can, can do it where there's not an antibody mediated process, it's actually direct mast cell activation. And th this is usually a dose dependent 
um, thing that occurs and the predominant um, symptoms are usually uh, cutaneous and respiratory rather than cardiovascular. And uh, they generally, because it's dose dependent, respond to either antihistamines before the administration of the drug or uh, slowing down of the infusion in the case of the vancomycin infusion syndrome. In terms of immunologically mediated hypersensitive reactions, we have the antibody mediated, which is the IgE mediated, which are the immediate hypersensitive reactions. And that is where you get cross-linking of the IgE, uh, degranulation of the mast cell and can lead to things like urticaria, but also uh, angioedema and anaphylaxis. And then the other um, part of the immunology mediated hypersensitive reactions are generally the T cell mediated. Um, and examples of this uh, include the um, simple drug rash that we sometimes get a few days after administration of amoxicillin. Another example is the abacavir hypersensitivity um, uh, that you get uh, in patients with HIV. Now, another way to classify um, um, adverse drug reactions and um, particularly um, allergy is uh, clinically. So um, we try to define them as either immediate or delayed or organ specific. And then there's a subgroup of very severe um, allergic reactions uh, called the severe cutaneous adverse reactions. And that includes acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, Stephen Johnson syndrome, toxic epigenal lecrolysis, as well as the DRESS reaction, which is a drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Um, you can see in the table here that um, there is a delay um, in uh, the, mainly the immediate ones, which present as urticaria or anaphylaxis. They typically occur with one, within one hour, but rarely up to six hours. However, all the other reactions, it's typically a, um, uh, more than that. And so um, can be up to four weeks uh, later. Uh, organs are specific, they're things like drug induced liver injury and also um, acute interstitial nephritis. So just um, again, clinically describing some uh, adverse drug reactions where we might see, you um, probably see these um, a, a lot in um, general practice. So just an example here of urticaria, so um, occurring sort of usually immediately after um, uh, antibiotic administration. And uh, you can see these um, uh, erythematous papules, which usually have a central clearing and uh, they'll generally um, move with time and clear. This is the um, macular papular drug exanthem, which may present after administration of the antibiotic a few days later. This pustulosis is an example of acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, which is in that severe cutaneous adverse reaction uh, group. And then also you can see actually shedding of the epidermis um, here, which would be consistent with um, Stephen Johnson syndrome or um, toxic epidermal necrolysis. So this is the next uh, clinical case. Uh, so we have a 56 year old man who's admitted with purulent lower limb cellulitis. He reports an unspecified penicillin allergy 20 years ago developed a rash many years ago, but did not require treatment and did not require any hospital admission. There's no angioedema, no anaphylaxis, and no features to suggest a severe cutaneous adverse reaction. And he's commenced on keprazolin. What's, what's the best next course of action? Great, so um, most of you have already um, talked about giving a, um, a uh, oral challenge to amoxicillin, which um, if, if you are set up um, to do that and, and make sure that, um, and can monitor them, um, then that would be uh, our um, um, best next course of action. So in terms of that, um, essentially that um, description of that clinical case, we we're able to actually re-stratify um, a, a patient um, in terms of the, the clinical case or whether they actually um, are likely to have a, a reaction to that antibiotic. Um, there's an Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare, which releases AMS clinical care standards. And as you can see here, 
uh, they describe essential elements for assessing an adverse uh, reaction uh, to, med uh, to a medicine. So uh, essentially um, going down to the description of the event, uh, what is the likelihood that that antibiotic actually caused um, the reaction? What was the severity? And that uh, could include things like, did they need hospitalization or not or treatment? and the date and the location of care, because that might be useful uh, in future if um, you're able to look at an electronic medical record. So as I said, complete assessment is important because risk stratif stratification aids in antibody uh, choice and essentially risk is determined by the severity of the reaction, the timing, whether it was immediate or non-immediate, and also the antibiotics tolerated since reaction. That's um, quite important because your most recent reaction is most um, predictive of a future reaction. So even though, say someone um, uh, has um, uh, uh, tolerated uh, cephalexin before, then had a quite a severe reaction to amoxicillin, uh, even though that they've tolerated cephalexin before that severe reaction, it doesn't necessarily that mean that they'll tolerate cephalexin now, uh, just because that intervening um, amoxicillin reaction occurred. And that's because antibiotic allergy stat, um, is dynamic rather than uh, static. And so essentially by doing that complete assessment, it gives us a risk stratification in terms of whether um, and basically a risk matrix of so whether the, um, the allergy was immediate or delayed and severe or non-severe. And so you can see here, immediate severe would include things like anaphylaxis, uh, compromised uh, airway, angioedema, um, fancy verticaria, hypertension or collapse. And then the severe delayed, they would be all the severe cutaneous adverse drug reaction. The non-severe um, immediate would just be mild urticaria or mild immediate rash that didn't really need any um, uh, treatment um, or maybe maybe just needed some um, antihistamine but no ho hospital admission, um, while a delayed non-severe rash would be a benign childhood rash or a macular um, papular rash. And from this sort of risk um, matrix, it um, essentially uh, tells us whether for one, uh, could they be appropriate for an oral challenge or two, uh, what uh, structurally related antibiotics we can give or which ones we need to avoid. So this is um, from um, the therapeutic guidelines and you can say, you can see that it's um, basically describes um, some recommendations in terms of what uh, can be um, given in terms of a beta-lactam anti beta antibiotic if, if it is a preferred drug based on someone's um, history. So uh, for instance, in the um, immediate severe uh, penicillin hypersensitivity, a recommendation would be avoid penicillins and um, cephalosporins, but safe to administer a non-beta-lactam antibiotic called as Trianam. In the immediate, um, um, non-severe, uh, safe to administer most um, uh, cephalosporins, and we'll talk about which ones you may need to um, uh, may need to avoid based on cross-reactivity, which is generally uh, based on the side chain of the antibiotic rather than the uh, beta-lactam uh, 4. And then in terms of the delayed pen penicillin hypersensitivity, the, the severe, severe cutaneous adverse reactions we generally avoid um, all beta-lactams, um, depending on a risk sort of benefit sort of analysis, may consider a carbapenem um, depending on the infection uh, that they have. And then in the delayed non-severe, they again uh, recommend avoiding penicillins, but may consider a uh, provocation challenge uh, test and it's safe to administer a cephalosporin. So the other thing is in terms of the risk stratification is that it, it's important in terms of uh, delabeling because we know that um, nine out of 10 patients reporting a penicillin allergy, allergy are not truly allergic uh, on further testing. And we know in the population around 10% of the population report a penicillin allergy. So it's quite a significant number in the community that have 
this allergy label. Um, however, only one out of those 10 are actually allergic on um, further testing. The reason for that is, um, as I said, allergy is dynamic. We know that ten, uh, skin test reactivity um, wanes over 10 years in about 80% of um, uh, patients. And also um, a lot of uh, childhood allergies that have been attributed to uh, often related to a viral illness rather than the um, antibiotic itself. So in terms of the reason delabeling is in, in, important um, is uh, because we often see it in, in hospital, there might be a penicillin allergy label without any further uh, details. And um, uh, often it, the, the path of least resistance or the easiest win, uh, way to avoid that is to uh, avoid it, um, basically prescribe a non beta lactam antibiotic or a non-cross-reactive um, uh, cephalosporin. But when we look at actually the data in terms of the actual penicillin allergy label in the electronic, uh, electronic health record, we know that there's an increased risk of treatment failure from um, um, uh, bacterial infection. There's an increased risk of adverse drug uh, events just because um, of the use of second line antibiotics. Um, there's an increased risk of Clostridioides uh, difficile increased risk of antibiotic resistance, so you're more likely to be colonised with MRSA and VRE. Uh, there's one study uh, in Massachusetts that showed there's an increased rate of surgical uh, site infection, uh, about a 50% increased um, rate. And then also another study showed there's an actually increased hosp in hospital mortality associated purely mediated by the penicillin allergy uh, label. And this is important because over 90% of reported penicillin allergies can be excluded by antibiotic allergy testing. And in terms of the delabeling, um, essentially um, that involves a history taking, as I said, a structured history, trying to risk stratify the, the, the patient into um, um, what type of antibiotic allergy uh, they fit into and hence, uh, we be able to challenge? Would we be able to directly delabel because their allergy reported is just actually a side effect? Um, and then the more higher risk uh, um, uh, skin testing followed by an oral challenge um, is usually uh, recommended. Um, the oral challenge is basically what we have now as the gold standard in terms of ruling out an antibiotic allergy. And so that um, means um, we hope to then improve their outcomes in future because they are able to then get better lactam treatment options, reduce exposure to antibiotics that cause C. diff and reduce um, antibiotic resistance and also reduce surgical site infection. So this is another way in terms of looking at risk and how we delabel. So at the very high end of the risk, there's sort of those with those severe cutaneous adverse reactions, so Stephen Johnson syndrome, uh, red flags, and in terms of the rash would be uh, skin desquamation, um, skin blistering, organ involvement, uh, or vital sign change, as well as um, emergency department vis visits or um, hospital admission. And so these um, uh, patients need to um, get a accessed in a um, in a clinic where they can have um, more sort of further testing in terms of trying to rule out um, which is the, um, the whether they're still sort of allergic or not and then down the uh, lower end are the ones that are quite lower risk which are more um, able to be delabeled from uh, either history taking them and then um, showing that it's just a non-allergic symptom versus uh, remote reactions cutaneous only where we can do a direct oral challenge. So um, Victoria um, and the Austin Hospital um, has been um, leading the way a lot in this um, in this space and um, this is one of the um, uh, guided histories that have been uh, um, developed at the Austin and taken up by the Victorian Therapeutics Advisory Group and you can see uh, this guided history um, uh, gives us sort of an idea of whether someone's appropriate for 
direct oral challenge or direct uh, delabeling if the, the patient's happy with that or uh, appropriate for a direct oral challenge. So that could include um, people with a diffuse rash more than 10 years ago or a child will exam them without any other high risk uh, features which would require um, referral for specialised skin testing. Another uh, um, uh, sort of uh, thing that came out of this group was um, the uh, pen fast um, clinical decision rule. So they developed this based on um, uh, those assessed um, at the the Austin, uh, Peter Mack and Royal Melbourne, believe, I believe, and then it was also retrospectively um, assessed against other clinics in Perth, Sydney and the US. And they found that this PENFAST score was uh, at good negative predictive value in terms of uh, predicting whether uh, someone would have a reaction to a direct oral challenge. And so, uh, and the negative predictive value was around 96%, uh, I believe. And you can see uh, this is an easy score uh, uh, that can just get done while you're assessing the patient. And so two points are awarded if you're five years or less since the reaction, two points if they describe any features to suggest anaphylaxis or angioedema or severe cutaneous adverse reaction, and one point if they required treatment for the reaction. And what they found was essentially anyone with a PENFAST less than Three, so zero, one, or two are a very low risk of having a positive penicillin um, uh, allergy test. And I'll talk um, a bit further. They then went on and did a randomised controlled trial, looking at this PENFAST score and and how it performed a, against people going down the traditional pathway of skin testing and then um, uh, undergoing an, uh, an oral challenge. So just going back to the case that we talked about before. Um, so just to recap uh, what we've gone through. So a 56 year old man presents to a GP practice with lower limb cellulitis. He reports an unspecified penicillin allergy 20 years ago, uh, developed a rash, didn't require treatment, didn't require any hospital mission, no angioedema, no anaphylaxis and no features to suggest scar and commenced on kefazolin. And so what is the allergy phenotype in this case? Yep. So um, good point actually there. I didn't say when the rash um, occurred after the administration of the um, antibiotic, um, but I was meaning to say um, that the rash had occurred a day after the administration of the penicillin. Um, so it was um, delayed non severe, but that's um, my fault for um, not putting that in the question. And so in the same, same gentleman, uh, what's the PENFAST score? Yep, so he just had a rash, didn't require any treatment. It's more than five years ago. Um, so, um, and there's no suggestion of, um, there wasn't any suggestion of angioedema or anaphylaxis, so his PENFAST score is zero. So going back to the PENFAST score, this was a randomised controlled trial that was just published uh, last year, which essentially looked at the efficacy of the clinical decision rule to enable direct oral challenge in patients with a low risk penicillin allergy. So um, this uh, involved six hospitals, both in Australia and um, in North America. And essentially patients with a PENFAS of two or less were either randomized to undergo skin testing followed by an oral challenge or a direct oral um, penicillin drug challenge. And essentially, um, the what was found was that there didn't appear to be any difference in the um, uh, uh, in the uh, primary outcome of a physician verified immune mediated positive um, oral challenge between the two groups, which sort of demonstrates um, that if your PENFAS is less than two, there's um, probably no benefit in um, undergoing skin testing before an oral challenge and we should just proceed to an oral challenge to try and rule out uh, the penicillin allergy. In terms of this um, uh, group, so uh, in the control group, which is the one that went skin testing uh, then followed by an oral challenge, there was one out of 190 patients that had a reaction within uh, an hour of the oral challenge 
and in the intervention, which was just a direct oral challenge, one out of the 187 had a, um, a, a reaction within one hour. They were both um, uh, cutaneous, uh, uh, mild reactions, just requiring antihistamines. They subsequently followed up uh, each and um, around uh, nine or 10 in both uh, groups had what was deemed to be an immune mediated um, event a, a few days uh, later, which uh, again, generally was just a, a, a mild rash which resolved. And so generally in the clinic now, if um, a pen fast is less, um, is two or less, uh, I'll consent the, the patients for a direct oral penicillin uh, challenge and we won't do uh, skin testing. Um, obviously you can't just um, completely um, just base it on the PEMFAS score because uh, people might report uh, anaphylaxis and um, but then report they didn't have treatment, which may make you question that whether they did have anaphylaxis, but you in those sort of situations where um, it does seem like a serious event that doesn't necessarily add up to sort of three or, or four, uh, you still might end up doing a skin uh, test. So, um, so going back to that clinical case again, um, which I think most of you already um, answered with what we um, suggested, uh, especially when they're admitted to hospital, is that uh, he had a um, delayed non-severe phenotype with a pen fast of zero. So ideally we'd like to consent for an oral amoxicillin challenge. And then if it tolerates this, change antibodies to flu clots um, and remove the penicillin allergy from this electronic medical record. However, in terms of um, in terms of actually um, setting up a penicillin um, evaluation component, um, there is a bit of time in terms of um, and a few protocols and policies that need to be set up in terms of so that a patient can have the challenge and, and be monitored while they're having the the, the challenge. Uh, um, in our clinic, uh, we monitor them for ninety minutes after the. Um, the challenge. In other clinics, it's 30 minutes to an hour. Um, and uh, so it is uh, sort of time intensive. Uh, at St. George, we run both an uh, antibiotic allergy clinic and also an inpatient uh, program where we uh, basically um, liaise with the treating team, especially if a patient is on current antibiotics and um, uh, go and see the patient, uh, re-stratify them, consent them for an oral challenge, and uh, then hand over the, the treating team to um, deliver that oral challenge and then uh, change the antibiotics to a penicillin-based uh, antibiotic. Uh, and in the clinic, um, we uh, again also uh, either skin test or oral challenge and then uh, usually have four spaces in the clinic that uh, we then monitor for uh, an hour and a half after the challenge. So that all um, uh, comes with time. However, um, there has been, um, and out of uh, for interest for um, um, all GPs out there, especially if you're interested in this area and want to um, set up uh, your own sort of uh, process, there's a couple of articles which have looked at um, this. So this comes from uh, Canada. Uh, where they um, uh, set up an amoxicillin oral provocation challenge in, in a primary care um, uh, clinic and basically risk stratified patients either into high risk or, or low risk. And from this retrospective review, they had 99 patients uh, who they reviewed and 96 completed an oral challenge without any reaction. Three just had a mild immediate reactions just requiring an, any histamine. And notably, those three were all pediatric patients. And um, that's one thing I should mention in terms of the PENFAS score. Um, it's well validated in, in adults, but not um, it shouldn't be used in children. And that's mainly mediated by that five year um, thing. So it uh, uh, should be used in um, adults. Uh, so it is um, definitely um, something that can be set up in, in primary care. And this is um, another um, article uh, from uh, the Melbourne group, which 
uh, this occurred during uh, COVID. So I think um, logistically um, it was quite hard, but I think for um, GP clinics um, did uh, set this up to uh, sort of deliver um, oral penicillin challenge. Uh, restrat 69 patients re um, included, they restratified 51 of those were, were low risk. Um, all of them had their penicillin allergy removed. In the 90 day follow up, there was five that had penicillin since that time and one of them developed a delayed uh, rash and not requiring um, any um, treatment. And so again, uh, demonstrate that it, it is feasible um, uh, in uh, primary care in, um, in Australia. Um, however, just because of the, the time and the um, time for observation, um, it, it, it's obviously uh, many barriers to in terms of um, uh, setting up widespread implementation of this procedure. But um, if um, any, anyone's interested in doing that in primary care, I'd be very happy to help. So having said that, um, if you're not set up in terms of the policies and procedures and in terms of um, creating a, a space where patients can be um, observed, um, this is a, a situation you may come across. So a 70 year old man presents you with lower limb cellulitis. He reports an unspecified penicillin allergy 20 years ago and developed a rash many years ago, did not and require any treatment, did not require any hospital admission, but you're not set up for an oral challenge. And uh, just to say that this um, this rash was um, delayed, so it developed a day after the administration of the penicillin. And so what's the best next course of action? Right, so uh, the 55% prescribed uh, cephalexin, um, which um, I would sort of advocate um, to be the next course of action, and we'll go through um, why that is and cross reactivity patterns. So you can see um, in this case, it's a delayed non severe uh, phenotype with a pen fast of zero. And so, as you can see with the um, antibiotic um, um, uh, therapeutic uh, guidelines, um, they've uh, essentially um, divided into that sort of risk matrix. Um, and you can see here in this case, it'd be delayed non-severe penicillin hypersensitivity. And so in that case, uh, it's safe to administer cephalosporins um, in those that had a mild reaction that occurred in the distant past. And so um, that's what we end up doing. And I guess in terms of kind of deal with uh, penicillin allergies in practice our antibody if someone comes in with an infection our antibody um, choice essentially depends on the antibody need what infection we're trying to treat historical severity of the reaction and the likely cross reactivity um, pattern and essentially from that likely the the likely cross reactivity pattern is more um, well defined in IgE mediated um, reactions um, rather than uh, delayed uh, reactions. Um, and so you can see, uh, for instance, uh, in the non-severe isolated urticarial mild rash, um, it is safe to use uh, non-cross-reactive uh, cephalosporins in those case, cases. And that sort of poses the question is which cephalosporins are likely to be cross-reactive and which aren't. So cross reactivity and penicillin allergy. So I think like at medical school and um, we, we often got taught that there was a 10% cross reactivity um, between cephalosporins and penicillins. And that's not um, um, true with sort of new data. We know that penicillins cross react, uh, that the cross reactivity pattern is probably about 2%. And the interesting thing is you can see here that um, Cephalosporins and penicillins have a, a core pedolactam ring, which you can see in the white, um, sorry, uh, the white section uh, here. 
And they've also got an axial uh, slide chain, which is the R1 slide chain. And then penicillins and cephalosporins then differ in that penicillins have a, also have a thiazole um, ladine rin, while uh, cephalosporins have a dihydrothiazine rin. Now, the things that, in, especially in IgE-mediated uh, uh, reactions, uh, the things that predict cross-reactivity is this R1 side chain. It's very rare to get um, an IgE-mediated uh, reaction to a beta-lactam RIN or to the thiazolidine RIN or the dihydrolysine RIN. Um, and so we can predict whether something's uh, likely to um, uh, cross-react based on that R1 side chain. And you can see here that some of the similar side chains uh, include uh, phenoxymethapenicillin and um, uh, benzyl penicillin. Um, but one of the um, more important, um, um, very similar side chains are amoxicillin, ampicillin, and cephalexin. So there's some studies that showed that the rate of cross reactivity between amoxicillin and cephalexin was up to um, 40%. And that's mediated purely by that uh, one chain. So uh, when we say that it's a non-severe immediate reaction, if it, um, if someone has a uh, amoxicillin um, allergy, uh, which was non-severe and immediate, it still would probably be okay to administer um, uh, keftriaxone in that situation. Similarly, in terms of uh, uh, cephalosporins, in, in general, cross-reactivity between cephalosporins is rare. However, um, those with a ketriaxone allergy, we should also avoid kepapine. And also, uh, while there's no cross-reactivity between penicillins and monobactams, the one thing we need to be aware of is if someone's had a ketazidine react, uh, reaction in the past, um, it has the exact same R1 chain as Aztreonam, which is a monobactam. So uh, generally, we would avoid Aztreonam in that uh, situation. Uh, the interesting thing to note is kefazolin is a unique structure, so it has that kefalosporin um, structure, but its side chain is unique. So um, it, it's very probable that someone might have a unique reaction to kefazolin, but will tolerate penicillins and other, um, um, other kefalosporins. The important thing to note is that this does not apply to severe delayed reactions. In severe delayed de reactions, we generally uh, avoid the entire class. Um, unless they've had uh, for further testing. So the next um, um, is um, a different penicillin uh, phenotype. So we've got a 70-year-old man that presents to your GP practice with upper limb cellulitis. He's afebrile, reports a penicillin allergy five years ago and almost immediately developed throat swelling and shortness of breath after the dose. It required hospital presentation and treatment, but not sure which type uh, penicillin allergy is listed on his chart. What is the best course of action? Great. So, um, so this is a severe immediate um, reaction. So, and it's very well possible that he had um, amoxicillin that he reacted to um, um, five years ago, and because of that cross reactivity between amoxicillin and cephalexin, in this situation, I would try and avoid cephalexin. Um, just because of its high rate of cross-reactivity between amoxicillin and cephalexin because of that similar R1 chain. And so um, um, I would sort of advocate to try and avoid beta-lactams in this situation and prescribe clindamycin and, and uh, refer on for further testing because uh, uh, I would recommend that this lady get some uh, skin tested and, and further tested in terms of what antibiotics they may be able to tolerate in future. The same um, situation, what is the PENFAST score? Yeah, great. So um, so this Jenna, um, this lady had the allergy five years ago, so that would give us two points. Uh, throat swelling, um, shortness of breath, concern about uh, angioedema or anaphylaxis, so another two points, and required hospital um, presentation and treatment, so another uh, one point. So um, we would suggest this is a, a high risk of a penicillin um, allergy test and uh, would have an immediate severe um, phenotype. So in terms of um, high risk um, um, allergy, um, this is um, 
in addition to sort of direct oral challenges for the low risk, we also do high risk um, allergy in the clinic. So that would include um, uh, skin testing and uh, drug challenges. So uh, if we divide the sort of approach um, to um, both immediate and, and delayed uh, reaction, so in immediate uh, skin testing has a pretty good negative predictive value for penicillin um, hypersensitivity. Uh, essentially, we do a um, cutaneous uh, skin prick test, including histamine, which is the positive control, and saline, as well as the uh, basic penicillin panel is uh, benzyl penicillin, ampicillin, uh, the penicillin major and minor determinants, um, which um, are used worldwide for um, penicillin allergy testing. If that is negative, we then go on to an intradermal test where we get a small needle or a bleb under the skin, uh, wait um, 15 to 20 minutes and then uh, read that bleb again to see if there's any increase in its size or whether there's any associated er erythema. If that's negative, depending on um, the, um, the history, we'll then go on and do a, uh, a drug challenge if the, uh, if, if the skin test is negative. However, you still have to be um, careful in those with um, a clear history of anaphylaxis. And the even if the skin test is negative in those situations, um, the skin test only has a, well, doesn't have 100% negative predictive value. So in those situations, uh, say they had amoxicillin, uh, we may consider a, a, a dose of phenoxymethapenicillin because we may be able to sh demonstrate that the allergy is specific to the R1 chain of the amoxicillin, but the patient could tolerate all other penicillins. In terms of uh, delayed um, um, hypersensitivities, uh, that the, um, the main uh, thing that we do uh, in clinic, we uh, don't tend to um, uh, further test Stephen Johnson's or, or Penn's in our clinic at the moment, but um, um, there is uh, other clinics that do, um, especially if the, um, the etiological agent isn't known, they may consider patch testing. Um, but uh, for other sort of delayed uh, reactions, um, such as macular papillary exanthem or, um, or, or, uh, or dress reactions, we um, uh, can do uh, intradermal testing with a delayed read. And so we read the intradermal test at 24 and 48 hours. And then depending on those results, then uh, the patient can come back and undergo an, an oral challenge to try and determine what was the etiological uh, antibiotic which caused the reaction, or is there another antibiotic that they're able to tolerate in the same class, uh, um, similar to what I mentioned about uh, maybe avoiding amoxicillin, but um, being able to tolerate other penicillin. So this is um, how we're set up. Um, in the clinic, so it, for those that just um, had an oral challenge um, and they were, were just ruling out a sort of immediate sort of uh, reaction, uh, we just give them an information sheet so that they can then contact us um, later if they get any delayed um, reaction, delayed rashes or any other issues. And then um, for the um, delayed um, antibiotic allergy, uh, we're now um, admitting them to our hospital in the home virtual service. So essentially they'll get a call from the um, nurse at um, the virtual hospital in the home at, um, uh, daily while we monitor them and um, we'll organise um, photos of their skin tests be um, sent to us so that we can review those. And then also a occasionally for uh, some people, uh, we also give prolonged challenges um, to antibiotics and in those situations they're also linked in with our hospital and the home virtual service so um, they've got a place to escalate should um, any reaction occur. So in terms of um, accessing our department uh, and specifically antibiotic allergy service there's the, um, the um, number there and, the, um, and our email and then here's a QR code we've got a um, uh, part of the Cesslid, um, the Cesslid website, we've got a, um, a um, antibiotic allergy page. So that has 
uh, some further information about antibody allergy. It also has links to um, the ASCIA um, uh, site, which uh, tells you which um, sort of uh, immunologists are in your um, area if you want to refer to an immunologist and um, uh, in, in your area. And um, uh, just to say that our service, because uh, I'm an infectious diseases uh, physician, I, I, we only um, deal with um, antibiotic uh, allergy. Um, and then if you have any sort of other questions, uh, my email is just down uh, here, so feel free to um, email me. And then um, uh, through uh, Baker just sent me these slides. So just um, to remember uh, health pathways, um, here's some details of uh, Robin and, and, and Sue. Um, this is again another QR code um, for the health pathways. Um, and there's the username and the password for that. And um, in terms of uh, any body allergy uh, clinic, uh, it can be found in the non acute immunology um, assessment uh, section. Uh, our referral form, I just need to update that on health pathways, but I'll. I'll um, do that uh, soon, um, but um, it sort of gives you another way to sort of refer to us if, if required. And um, yeah, that's um, that's the end of the talk. So thanks so much for listening. Thanks, Richie. We've got a few questions. Yeah, um, sure. Not too many, but I would, while I'm reading these ones out, I'd encourage anyone who has a question uh, to please post it and I'll just keep throwing them Richie's way. So <laughs> the first one is, and, and if not, then I've got a couple myself. Nice. Um, so the first one is um, a comment kind of. Um, Having an adverse reaction of an obvious rash to a moxil, again prescribing a moxil and developing a rash again, it's not comfortable for the patient and certainly they won't be happy. Mm. So um, yeah. the the doctor is saying, I, I think practically we would avoid amoxicillin. Please comment. Mm. Yeah, so I, I often, um, we go through an informed consent process and so if we were... Um, setting that that's what I was trying to sort of illustrate that there's a whole process that you need to set up in terms of doing oral challenges and so I usually when I'm consenting someone for an oral challenge I'll say that the rate of precipitating a rash is um, around uh, in a low risk uh, um, patient would be about three um, percent and um, but um, more severe reactions um, while there, there are um, a risk, it's um, not really being described. And um, uh, and so there is an informed consent um, process that it can occur and that's, and some patients don't want to challenge, some patients want to determine whether they do still have a penicillin allergy. And as I said, uh, the skin reactivity is lost uh, in 80% of um, people over 10 years. So um, there's a lot of people that, even though they've had a rash in the past, they won't necessarily have one now. Um, there's another question about amoxyl and infectious mononucleosis. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you occasionally yeah. get that macular papular rash. How yeah. do you distinguish it between the infection or the allergy? Because we think it's probably yeah. a drug, drug reaction in combination yeah. with the virus, but would love to hear your your preaching. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> yeah, that's well, yeah, that's well described that amoxicillin EBV association and um, does precipitate it. Um, and so I've I've often seen patients in the clinic with that sort of uh, uh, situation. Um, sometimes if there's it, it's sort of it, it's very hard sort of to determine uh, between the two, and so. Um, I, Sometimes when I'm going, if if it's sort of low risk, um, sort of rash, um, and we decide to go straight for an oral challenge once the EBV is resolved, um, explain to them that usually these rashes occur in the context of EBV, but some sort of red flags would be the rash lasting longer, requiring treatment. In which case, um, we may need to do some further testing because it actually may be a true amoxicillin allergy, but it's it's very hard to tell clinically whether it's just related to the EBV or whether it's a true allergy. Yeah. 
So if the patient was, say, an 18-year-old adolescent, so um, <clears throat> not a child, yeah. and they got that rash, which resolved fairly easily, and they might have taken some antihistamine because they were a bit uncomfortable, even yeah. though it wasn't particularly urticarial. How soon after their illness is resolved would you consider doing an oral amoxyl challenge? I would probably wait a few months, yeah. Well, they're going to wait to get into your clinic anyway, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's true. Mm. But then they've also, yeah. as you've been saying, they've got a chance over the next five to ten years of that, if it was a true allergy, of that yeah. oral reactivity um, disappearing yeah. anyway. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Right. Um, another question is, do you only check for penicillin allergies um, or do you ch check for other antibiotics? Yeah, we um, check all um any anyone with any antibiotic allergy we will be able to um, assess. Most of the data in terms of the AMS outcomes and all that sort of stuff is typically um, in the penicillin space. So uh, most of our referrals are either penicillin or cephalosporin allergies, but uh, we often uh, get suspected allergies to gentamicin or metronidazole or clarithromycin. Um, and the, probably the second most common after penicillin is cephalosporins are probably um, the sulfonamides, so um, Bactrim, and they're usually, um, there's more need to delabel those, especially in the immunocompromised cohort, because they may need it for PJP prophylaxis or um, mm. something like that. Mm. And so for those, um, we, we do delabel. For the others, it sort of depends on what is their what a need going to be in future? Um, mm -hmm. Do we do we sort of um, go through that process? Like, are they likely going to need metronidazole in future? Or um, and so that sort of all weighs in in terms of that informed consent discussion and whether we proceed with further mm -hmm. testing or not. As GPs, we have an issue with our software. Um, I use Medical yeah. Director, which is the second most commonly used in general practice. And I yeah. can enter a drug reaction as an allergy or an adverse reaction and describe what happened. But then in a health summary, it just goes through as an allergy. So you receive yeah. it. I've coded it right, but you receive it coded wrong. And so does the My Health Record mm. suggestions, apart from getting the you know, clinical yeah. software companies to fix their game. <laughs> yeah, so um, so that's disappointing. That's the first time I've heard of that issue occurring. I think I think there may be um, sort of um, national programs sort of looking at that and how uh, allergies um, um, are actually documented in the My Health record because what we know is that when people see it, um, an allergy listed often a history is not then taken again and mm. then and then people just avoid it so um i unfortunately don't have any suggestions in terms of what you can do in medic director but i think um i think sort of national programs might be looking at that yeah mm. and um i'm really waiting for other people to ask questions one more question from me um when you're doing an oral challenge if you get urticaria like a couple of days later they ring the clinic and they go i've got this welty rash um mm. what what do you advise because that's a delayed mild reaction but so what yep. do you advise the patient uh so i say we confirm the allergy um mm. and sometimes we need to give them some antihistamines if that um helps them um, but I say it's a mild reaction and just update it exactly with the reaction type as according to those AMS mm -hmm. clinical criteria and um, suggest when I write back to the GP, suggest that they update the allergy as such because then uh, it means in future um, we can risk stratify them in terms of what antibiotics can be given uh, for future infections. Yeah. So um, taking it one step further, that patient comes back and they've got syphilis because um, yeah. there's a bit of that around at the moment, right? Yeah. Would it be a reasonable thing to give them the penicillin injection and some antihistamines, or do you need to select the alternative treatment? So it depends on what type of penicillin it was. So there's a chance that if they reacted... Benzathine penicillin. Yeah, um, and so they reacted to benzathine penicillin. Oh, I see. No, they reacted yeah. to amoxil in the past. 
Yeah, so there's a chance mm. people might be allergic to amoxil, but not allergic to penicillin mm -hmm. because of that side chain uh, specificity. So um, I would advocate that they potentially have a phenoxymethapenicillin challenge and then have benzathine penicillin. And so if I rang and you and said, I've got someone that needs a phenoxymethyl penicillin challenge tomorrow so I can give them a great big jab of penicillin. Can you fit yeah, them in so, at short notice? Yeah, so we leave a, um, I don't, unfortunately I don't run a clinic every week, um, but um, we uh, would, we, I try and leave one of the beds uh, empty for um, those urgent situations where it's treatments needed um, uh, more uh, urgently. And so we'll try and fit them in uh, in that situation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. So Bertha, I'll hand over to you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Sullivan, for your time. Thank you, Martina, for facilitating this evening. Um, the evaluation survey will pop up on your screens as soon as we close the webinar.